And I'd like to extend a special thank you to Nathan Vargas uh, for inviting me uh, to this event and also um, for organizing it. I know it took a lot of uh, work uh, to organize and you had to do it twice. I'm sorry about the last time and I thank you for doing it again and for everybody for coming back uh, to hear me again. Uh, it's a real honor to be here today. Um, I'd like to also thank uh, the English department at uh, St. Berkman's College. And um, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to be speaking from notes uh, for about maybe an hour, hour and 15 minutes. Um, and th then we'll open it up to questions and uh, questions either about uh, the text that I'm gonna talk about uh, or anything about trauma theory that you wanna talk about. And um, I also would be very interested in hearing about uh, if, if you're thinking about uh, trauma is specifically in the uh, Indian context, that interests me a lot as well. Uh, the talk I'm, ta I'm giving today does not concern specifically the Indian context. Um, and I'm going to speak in particular on um, my interpretation of Shoshana Feldman's uh, essay, A Ghost in the House of Justice. And what I'll do is I'm gonna give a framework for it. And then I'm gonna show a little bit of the video of uh, the Eichmann trial uh, that she is discussing in her essay. And then I'm gonna sort of review uh, the major points I made in the essay. Um, so uh, I wanna briefly share with you a slide that is an epigraph uh, for this presentation. Um, and <clears throat> this is, um, Uh, this is a quotation by the psychoanalyst and trauma theorist Francoise Devon and Jean-Max Gaudier. Uh, Jean-Max Gaudier has now died. Uh, Francoise Devon is still alive. Uh, they were uh, French um, analysts and theoreticians and working with um, people who have been incarcerated in um, mental institutions. So they work with madness. And uh, they say, uh, when the guarantees of speech are closed, how construct an other to whom to speak? Okay. <clears throat> so um, my work on uh, Shoshana Feldman and the essay that I gave you uh, is part of a larger project of rethinking trauma theory in new terms, and specifically in terms of the problem of address, um, the failure of address and the need to produce new forms of address in order to produce new kinds of witness to trauma. And I think that uh, Shoshana Feldman's work uh, and her work with her co-author in the book Testimony, Crises of Witnessing in Literature, Psychoanalysis and History which is a book that's a little older than the book from which her essay comes. Uh, I believe that uh, their work is an important place that we can pursue this rethinking of uh, trauma theory. Um, but the idea of trauma as a problem with address, that is how do I address my story to another who is there to listen um, and what kind of address would be required to make it um, hearable. Is a, is a motif that actually runs through a lot of trauma theory uh, over the last several decades, including as I uh, just quoted um, the work of uh, Devoin and Gaudier, but also um, we can find it in philosophical writings such as uh, the work of Emmanuel Levinas, uh, the work of Jean-Francois Lyotard um, and other thinkers and writers. So, it's part of a larger framework and it's something I'm, I'm working on now. Um, so the paper that I gave uh, today, um, the body's testimony, dramatic witness in the Eichmann trial, which is an interpretation of Shoshana Feldman's A Ghost in the House of Justice, which comes from her book, uh, The Juridical Unconscious, Trials and Traumas in the 20th Century. Um, 
the, that essay that I gave you can be understood um, within this uh, context of working on address, but also more largely within the context of my longstanding engagement with Sigmund Freud's great work uh, from the beginning of his career as well as later in his career on the theory of trauma. Uh, and particularly uh, in his book, uh, After World War I, Beyond the Pleasure Principle, uh, in which trauma is understood in terms of a particular enigmatic temporal structure. Um, so this temporal structure of trauma uh, can be understood as follows very briefly, that uh, trauma is an event or the experience of an event that is not assimilated as it occurs. Uh, it's too overwhelming, too sudden to be assimilated uh, or fully known as it occurs. And it returns later in the form of behavioral reenactments, repetitive nightmares, um, affects, and so on. So it, it returns, uh, it's repeated, uh, comes back later as something that is not yet known uh, over and over again. But this return also uh, has the force of a command. So if we think of the traumatic nightmare that wakes you up from sleep, um, it's a kind of command to see or to know something that has not yet been grasped or assimilated. And in Freud, this always has, and I've written a lot about this, a kind of double structure. Uh, on the one hand, um, it's, the encounter with a death experience that has not been fully assimilated, uh, that remains incomprehensible. Uh, but it's also the experience of survival that is not yet fully comprehensible. So it's um, a, the repetitions involve both a kind of missed death and a missed survival. So they point backward to this experience of violence or catastrophe, but also forward to a future that uh, remains to be claimed, a survival that remains to be claimed. And that double aspect of trauma is going to show up also in um, Fellman's A Ghost in the House and Justice, um, I believe. Um, and I'll talk more about that. So as I say in the beginning of uh, the essay I sent, uh, Fellman and Laub's work in their book, uh, Testimony, Crises of Witnessing in Literature, Psychoanalysis and History um, can be understood as reinterpreting the notion of trauma through a problem of witness. And they're focusing specifically in that book on the Holocaust as a major collective traumatic event in the 20th century. And in that book, they, they speak about trauma as a collapse of witnessing. Um, so it's a collapse of witness at the time of the event. The event actually, the Holocaust for them is constituted by a failure to witness that comes back later, uh, both as something, a, a continued failure to witness, but also as the command for a new kind of witness. Um, and they refer in that book to the Holocaust as, as an event without a witness. And this doesn't mean that no one saw it or tried to write it down, um, but rather that uh, adequate witnessing to the event uh, couldn't take place during the actual occurrence. And so um, it only happens later when the experience comes back in individuals and also more collectively in a, in a society or a culture uh, to command witness to what hasn't uh, been seen. So this idea of uh, the collapse of witness, an event is a collapse of witness, um, uh, is shifts the notion of trauma. Um, and the idea of, um, the return of um, uh, this unwitnessed event um, 
allows for a notion of a uh, new notion of testimony as a new kind of potential witness emerging from the site of the collapse of witness. And uh, it shifts the notion of trauma from an epistemological issue to a problem of telling to others um, and a problem of listening. So it shifts the idea of trauma from what we know or don't know uh, to a problem of address. So the experience that I have is something I cannot address to others or for, for which uh, there is no one to hear. Um, so that brackets the question of whether I do or do not um, grasp or know the trauma myself. And it puts the focus on uh, being able to speak it or others being able to listen to it. And um, in Crises of Witnessing, uh, Dory Laub says the following. Um, uh, he says, um, one has to conceive the Holocaust as a world in which the very imagination of the other was no longer possible. There was no longer an other to which one could say thou in the hope of being heard, of being recognized as a subject, of being answered. The historical reality, the Holocaust became thus a reality which extinguished philosophically the very possibility of address, the possibility of appealing or of turning to another. So um, the, the notion of uh, the Holocaust or of traumatic experience more generally as a collapse of address uh, allows us to think about it uh, as collective experience, not simply individual experience. Um, and in fact, it doesn't model trauma so much on individual experience as on something larger um, that involves uh, a group of people or more than one person. Um, it also allows us to think of forms of active erasure and denial, um, uh, social denial, political denial, um, as being part of the traumatic event. Um, the refusal to hear the inability to listen in a larger culture becomes central to this thinking of trauma. So it involves not only a psychological um, element to it, that is, I don't grasp or assimilate the trauma, I don't witness it my, to myself, but rather, uh, but also, and maybe more importantly, a larger political and social dimension to the trauma, which I think actually is all, always the case um, in Freud's work, if you read him carefully, but is frequently not recognized. A lot of people think of trauma in Freud as being purely psychological, um, but in fact, it's a much larger and more complex notion. And I think that that comes out in their idea of um, the collapse of witness or the collapse of address. So from this perspective, uh, uh, trauma is a story that cannot be addressed to or heard by another. So um, just to repeat then, um, to say that trauma is a collapse of witness, as Feldman and Laub do in relation to the Holocaust, um, is also to say that trauma is a collapse of address. Um, and the repetition of trauma, so trauma as its repetition or trauma as its later return, because trauma is, is its repetition, it is its unfolding later, it's not one event, but always more than one event, several events. Um, or we could say the event of trauma is an unfolding. It is a history. Um, it's never just the violence, but it's the return um, of that ungrasped experience of violence. Um, so uh, to say that trauma is a collapse of witness means it's a collapse of address that returns. Um, and simultaneously, it's the command for a new kind of witness that is a new kind of address um, at the point of its collapse. So what in, in Freud would be the command, let's say, to see, to wake up, if we use the language of Freud, the language of the nightmare, uh, wake up 
see something, see what you haven't seen. Um, in, in this understanding is a command to address others anew. Um, and so, uh, so it picks up again on the double notion of trauma as both a returning uh, incomprehensible encounter with death and of survival, um, that double notion. And that's very, uh, here it takes the form of the collapse of address and the command for a new kind of address. Um, and as I say in the paper, I think that the idea of um, th this idea, uh, both of the collapse of witness and the collapse of address is constituting um, trauma um, and in particular collective trauma uh, is illustrated concretely in Feldman's reading of the Eichmann trial um, in Jerusalem. Uh, so the, the trial of Adolf Eichmann, one of the central Nazis who coordinated the exterminated, extermination of the, of the European Jews, along with many others. Um, she reads this problem of the collapse of witness concretely in the actual fall of an individual witness on the stand, um, the man who identified himself, a literary writer, as Kutsetnik, who falls into unconsciousness um, as he is being questioned on the witness stand during the trial. Um, and uh, so first of all, the way I interpret this is, um, Feldman's essay on uh, Kutsetnik is it illustrates uh, the collapse of Kutsetnik as she reads it is first of all, an illustration of their larger notion, theoretical notion of the collapse of witness that constitutes the Holocaust. Um, and uh, in this case, it's an individual actual witness collapsing on the stand, but it's kind of allegorizes this larger notion of trauma as the collapse of witness. Um, and, uh, secondly, um, as I try to read her work, um, it's specifically a, uh, the fall of Kutsetnik is a reenactment of the collapse of witness. And that can be understood as a reenactment of the collapse of address and annihilation of dress that uh, takes place at a specific moment in Kutsetnik's experience. Um, and so the moment uh, in the trial when Kutsetnik falls is a, uh, a rupture within the structure of address and response that's happening at the moment in the trial when the, first the, the prosecutor and then the judge uh, try to get um, uh, Kutsetnik to uh, talk about his, his experience and in particular his uh, eyewitness experience of Auschwitz. Uh, they need his eyewitness experience because they're trying to convict Aus uh, of, uh, sorry, his eyewitness experience of Eichmann at Auschwitz. And they need that because they're trying to convict Eichmann. Um, and so Kutsetnik's uh, testimony as an eyewitness is very important, but he has started to go into kind of a trance and talk about planet Auschwitz and it's not the same thing as, you know, and it becomes very literary in, as Feldman suggests and they interrupt him and try to get him to speak um, in his own name in his legal, un, under his legal name, De Her, uh, De, Yale uh, Denour, they say to him, uh, Mr. Denour, uh, could you please answer the question we've asked? And that's when he collapses. Um, so when he collapses, it breaks the structure of address and response uh, in the legal setting um, that is happening at the moment in the trial. And as I understand Feldman's argument, this is a reenactment, um, a traumatic reenactment. And what it reenacts is a moment in the camps that was also um, a collapse of address, but in that case was actually the annihilation of address. Uh, by a Nazi speaking to Kutsetnik. Um, so the questions uh, that I raise in this, in this essay um, are how does the fall of Kutsetnik illustrate the traumatic reenactment of a previous event, 
um, an event which is constituted as a collapse of address? And secondly, how might we understand this reenactment as simultaneously at this very moment of the fall, um, enabling of a new kind of address or testimony, a new possibility of address? Um, and Fellman's essay is very subtle because the fall, the moment of the fall of the witness on the stand is two things at once. Um, on the one hand, it's the return of the trauma. And her book, The Juridical Unconscious, is more largely about the return of major traumatic events on the site of the law in major trials, what she calls trials uh, of the century. And the Eichmann trial is a trial of the century. And so it's also repeating um, the traumatic event that it is supposed to be um, addressing legally. And at the point that it's trying to produce a legal response to the event, the event recurs at, in the courtroom. Um, and so um, uh, on the one hand, there's a reenactment happening. On the other hand, and at the same moment that this reenactment occurs, um, there's a transformation of this uh, traumatic reenactment into uh, a, a, at least the possibility, the condition of possibility for some other kind of response, a new kind of testimony, a new kind of address. And they happen at the moment, both of those happen at the moment of the fall. So the fall is a pivot between trauma and testimony, between the collapse of address and the possibility of a new kind of address. Um, she calls that moment the dramatic. And just to um, uh, point something out that I found very difficult for years, uh, her, uh, her understanding of, of that encounter as a whole between Kitsetnik and the court uh, is framed in terms of the encounter between the language of the law and the language of literature. Kitsetnik is a writer. Um, and at the moment of the collapse, she says they explode each other. So uh, they cannot hear each other. Um, they cannot address each other. Um, that moment she calls the dramatic. So the dramatic is neither a purely legal moment nor a purely literary moment. It's the moment when the, the two of them uh, encounter each other, explode each other and transform each other. And so the dramatic is this moment of pivoting between trauma and testimony. So uh, here are just a few implications of uh, the reading that I did of Feldman's essay on um, the trauma of the Holocaust and of the collapse of witness uh, through the problem of address. So first of all, um, to think of uh, Kutsetnik's collapse um, in terms of a collapse of address and the repetition of the annihilation of address um, explains uh, why the traumatic return of the Holocaust on the site of the law is not simply a matter of a psychological experience, uh, but as I said before, of a social, political, and legal collective event of annihilation. Um, all of these in this case are mediated by a question of language. And as I suggest, it has to do with the language of the Nazi. Uh, and in the case of Kuzetnik, the language of the Nazi at a particular moment, the moment of selection when um, the Nazi says, these people will die and these people will live. Um, secondly, uh, thinking of uh, the collapse of Kuzetnik in these terms, allows us to understand the temporality of trauma anew. And this is of real interest to me and it's something I'm trying to think about more these days. Um, it allows us to understand the temporality of trauma in terms of the specific temporality of a concrete linguistic problem that is the way in which an utterance annihilates its addressee. And although the example of that in this essay is the Nazi um, addressing 
the inmate of the camp, the victim, and thereby annihilating um, him in this case, um, annihilating him as an adversary. Uh, that is, this idea of the um, annihilation of the addressee is not limited, of course, to um, the Holocaust. Uh, and so I'm, I'm interested in, and I, I'll talk about it, I'll review it because I talk about it in the essay, the way in which the experience of um, the annihilation of oneself is uh, being annihilated as a, an addressee or a human witness, um, how that has a particular temporal structure of belatedness. And I, I think we, the idea of the temporality of trauma um, needs to be interpreted. It can be interpreted in terms of empirical temporality. So trauma happened at this point in time and it returns at a later point in time as not understood. That's sort of the general um, understanding of the temporality of trauma. But this is an enigmatic temporality. It's not immediately clear that we can only understand it in terms of periods of time along an, an axis of time. Um, I think that we can also understand it around this problem of the command that annihilates its addressee and the response to that command. So the temporality of trauma here is the temporality of the collapse of address or the annihilation of dress. And I'll come back to that. And the third implication is um, of reading the Kitsetnik fall in terms of uh, the collapse of address um, is that it allows us to understand in very concrete terms, this pivot between trauma and testimony. Um, so the pivot in what Feldman calls the moment of the dramatic, um, the fall as being an illustration of the dramatic, a gesture, a bodily um, display. Um, we can understand very concretely in the courtroom what it means that this is at the one, on the one hand, a failure of witness and a collapse of address between the court, that is the prosecutor and the judge and Kitsetnik on the one hand. On the other hand, it acts upon the audience in the courtroom, not the court itself, but the audience sitting there um, in a way that addresses them. So we can see very concretely this move between trauma and testimony um, through this idea of address. So now I'm gonna show, it's about, it's a maybe, I, I don't know exactly around 10 minutes long. I'm gonna show the video uh, of that moment in the court when um, Kitsetnik, uh, oops. I'm gonna show that, um, a video of that moment when Kitsetnik falls. Um, President of court, please quiet in the courtroom. Do you speak Hebrew, sir? Yes, please place the skull cap on your head and put your right hand on the Bible. And please say after me, I swear by God Almighty that my testimony in this trial will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. What is your full name? Dinor, Mr. Dinor, you live in Tel Aviv in Megiddo Street, yes, number eight. Sir. You are a merchant. You are a writer, I'm sorry. Yes. You were born in Poland? Yes. And you are the author of the books Salamandra and the House of Dolls and two other books. 
and the, the book named, they called him Pipel. What is the reason why you chose the literary pseudonym Ka Tsetnik, Mr. Dinor? This is not a pen name. I do not regard myself as a writer writing literature. This is actually the history of the Auschwitz planet. The chronics of Auschwitz. I, myself, was at Auschwitz camp for two years. <laughs> the time there is not a concept as it is here in our planet. Every fraction of a second has a different wheels of time. And the inhabitants of that planet had no names. They had no parents and they had no children. They were not clothed as we are clothed here. They were not born there and they did not conceive there. They breathed and lived according to different laws of nature. They did not live according to the laws of this world of ours, and they did not die. Their name was a number. Katsetnik number so-and-so. They were dressed in, how shall I call it? Mr. Hausner showing the witness a suit of striped clothes. Is that what you used to wear there at Auschwitz? So, Yes, this is the garb of those who lived on this planet called Auschwitz. And I believe wholeheartedly that I must carry this name as long as the world will not awaken after the crucifying of the nation to erase this evil as humanity has risen after the crucifixion of one man. I believe wholeheartedly that the same as in astrology, the stars influence our fate. In the same way, the star at Auschwitz is there facing our planet and influencing, radiating towards our planet. If I am able to stand here in this court before you and retail, retell the tale of this planet, if I 
out of this planet of Auschwitz. I'm able to be here with you today. Then I believe with all my being that this is thanks to the oath I made to them there They gave me the strength, this power, this oath was my armor, and this was the power, the unnatural power above nature, which sustained me. So that after the period of Auschwitz, two years in Auschwitz, when I was a Muslim, to withstand Auschwitz, they always left me. They always took leave of me. And the look in their eyes had the promise of my oath in them. Almost two years, I stayed there, and I was always left behind. I can still see them gazing at me. I saw them in the queue. Uh, and was, uh, could I perhaps, Mr. Dinur, put a few questions to you if you will consent? As President of Court, Mr. Dinur, please, please listen to Mr. Hausner and to me. Check it, check it, check it. שבו במקומכם בבקשה, אני מבקש מאוד, כן? כל אחד יושב במקומו. שבו במקומכם, שבו, שבו, שבו. אני אצטרך להפסיק. כן. אני מצטרך להפסיק. President of court, I'll have to stop this session unless uh, the witness recovers. Mr. Hausner, I did not expect this, of course, to happen, and I think it would be difficult for the witness to recover. Uh, the witness's wife, who is in the audience, is now uh, approaching him. <laughs> President of court, I do not believe we can go on. We shall make a, take a recess now, and uh, you, Mr. Attorney General, will kindly inform us as soon as you find out whether the witness is capable of going on. You can see me again. Okay, <laughs> good. All right. Um, so, as you can see, the actual event is much more powerful than um, when it's described. And 
there's a lot to say about that video. So I'm be interested in hearing what people have to say afterwards. Um, to give the larger context of Feldman's reading of this moment, um, in it's chapter four of her book, The Juridical Unconscious. And in chapter three, she is focused on the icon trial as a whole um, and its use of human witnesses, unlike the Nuremberg trial, um, and human witnesses who are talking about their experiences. Um, and what she argues in chapter three is that by bringing the fragile uh, witnesses of the survivors onto the stand, the trial allows them to attain a kind of authority through the legal authority and more generally cultural authority to tell their stories. And so the testimonies are taken out of the realm of private fragmented experiences and allowed to become a collective recognized experience called the Holocaust. So she argues this is the first time, the trial uh, is the first time that we actually get the idea of the Holocaust. So chapter three is focused on the success of the speech of the witnesses. Whereas uh, chapter four, the essay that I gave you is focused on the fall of Kutsetnik as central to the trial. So, and originally these were, these essays, uh, chapter three and four were one essay and they got divided into two. So um, she moves from the speech, the success of the speech of testimony to the importance of the fall into silence of a single witness. And so by implication, um, she seems to be arguing intuitively because much of her work is intuitive um, that the speech of the successful testimonies, that is the speech of witness, is inhabited by a failed testimony, by a kind of silence. Um, and that uh, Kotetnik's fall um, reverberates not only throughout the trial, but in a sense within um, the other testimonies as well, symbolically. Um, so, uh, why is it that Kutsetnik can be considered so emblematic um, of the trial and of testimony? Because um, Fellman is arguing in particular against uh, Hannah Arendt's um, <clears throat> uh, understanding of Kutsetnik in her work on um, the banality of evil, her report on the Eichmann trial, uh, Hannah Arendt makes fun of Kutsetnik as a failed witness. <clears throat> and she sees his fall as almost a theatrical event um, <clears throat> that deprives the prosecution of their testimony, their eyewitness testimony and for Hannah Arendt, this illustrates the problem with bringing um, these human witnesses on the stand in the first place. Fellman is arguing that not only is Kutsetnik not a failed witness, but that his fall um, is central to the impact the trial would have in memory and collective memory um, in cultural memory. And it's even recorded by the judges in their final um, uh, verdict. So uh, why, why can she argue this centrality? And one of the reasons, and um, I talk about this in the essay, is that the person who frames the trial, Gideon Hausner, the prosecutor, frames it in a, a way that is similar to what Kutsetnik says about his own testimony. So I will just share this for a moment. Um, so Gideon Hausner says, um, when I stand before you judges of Israel in this court, I do not stand alone. With me stand 6 million prosecutors. 
but alas, they cannot rise to the level uh, to level the finger of accusation in the direction of the glass dock and cry out j'accuse against the man who sits there. For their ashes are piled in the hills of Auschwitz, their blood cries to heaven, but their voice cannot be heard. Thus it falls to me to be their mouthpiece and to deliver the awesome indictment in their name. Um, and Ketsetnik says of his own testimony, all of them are now buried in me and continue to live in me. I made an oath to them to be their voice. And when I got out of Auschwitz, they went with me, they in the silent blocks and the silent crematorium and the silent horizons and the mountain of ashes. So uh, Ketsetnik has an um, exemplary place in the trial because he, like the prosecutor, wants to give a voice to the dead. Um, so we could also say then that uh, Hausner's legal project or the trial's legal project of giving voice to the dead um, is inhabited also by Ketsetnik's, uh, what Feldman calls Ketsetnik's literary project or Ketsetnik's um, desire to give voice to the dead. And in that sense, the uh, fall of Ketsetnik is bound up with the function of the trial um, as not only giving voice to the living witnesses, the survivors, but giving voice to the dead um, who cannot be there. And these two ways of giving voice, um, the legal and what Feldman calls the literary, the traumatic slash literary in the case of Ketsetnik, um, are, uh, we could say, um, they, she says they come together, they miss or explode each other. So they have a kind of missed encounter, which is a failure in a sense that they fail to address each other, but they're also in, entangled with each other. Um, so the failure is also an entanglement of the two that produces this new form of testimony. Um, and we can see that uh, if we look at the trajectory of her essay, what happens here is that the desire to give voice to the dead turns into, is reversed at the moment of the fall, the trauma and the dead take over the trial. And that's when Ketsetnik falls. Um, so instead of giving voice to the dead, he is muted by them. Um, and what will emerge from that um, at the end of the essay is nonetheless this other way in which the dead will speak. And she calls that the expressionless or the death head that emerges in the trial. Um, so again, the fall is being engulfed, muted by the dead that you wanted to give voice to on the one hand. And the, uh, on the other hand, the production of a, a faceless face, something like the way in which the communication from the dead actually takes place. And that's this new form of testimony. So just to review, how, how then does this missed encounter take place or how then does the trauma get reenacted? Um, and uh, to go back to Feldman's text, it happens at a moment in particular when the judge, the, first the prosecutor and the judge are trying to address uh, the witness by his legal name. So he has been identified um, by his, um, his name Kitsetnik, under which he writes, which basically means concentration cab inmate. And he's addressed by his legal name. And this is when he falls. And so what Feldman says, just to remind you of this moment in her is, um, uh, uh, that because he's speaking for the dead, Ketsetnik must remain like them anonymous and nameless. He must testify under the name Ketsetnik, but in a court of law, a witness cannot remain nameless and cannot testify anonymously. A witness is accountable precisely to his legal name. 
Mr. Dunor, please listen to Mr. Hauser and to me, says the presiding judge impatiently, putting an end to the account that the witness gives of the adopted name. Kitsetnik faints because he cannot be interpolated at this moment by his legal name, Dunor. The dead still claim him as their witness, as Kitsetnik, who belongs to them and is still one of them. The court reclaims him as its witness, as Dunor. He plunges into the abyss between the different planets. On the frontier between the living and the dead, between the present and the past, he falls as though he were himself a corpse. Uh, so, um, at the moment that the judge tries to address Kitsetnik as a legal subject, he falls um, and falls back into his name as concentration camp survivor. Um, he falls sort of between the two, as she says. So it's specifically a failure, not only to witness, but to be addressed and to address the judge. Um, and uh, this collapse between, of address between the court and witness uh, is transferred also over to the audience in the courtroom because when he falls down as unconscious, they are brought into the drama looking at what looks like a dead body um, in the same way that Kitsetnik himself had been um, seeing those going off to die in um, the concentration camp. So at this moment, um, not only could Setnik is reenacting something she will argue from the past, but the entire courtroom becomes part of a drama. And that's very, very important because it's not just uh, Kitsetnik who falls and begins uh, because he has um, begin to re begun to re-experience something inside the camp, but the entire courtroom becomes involved in a drama of reenactment. Um, and at one point, Philman will say the court, the law itself losing con loses consciousness. So in fact, the whole legal system becomes drawn in to this moment to reenact something. Um, so what is this reenactment? Um, and uh, Fellman, um, uh, so I won't read this whole thing, but what Fellman um, repeats here is the movement from uh, Kitsetnik's describing the planet Auschwitz. Um, and just at the moment that he's describing the, the uh, moment of selection when other inmates are told that they will die and they go off to the gas chamber and they are, he says, they are watching me. I see them. And just at the moment he says, I see, I see them. He's interrupted by the judge. Um, and that's when the judge says, please, Mr. Denor, um, uh, can you answer the question? And he falls. Um, so at this moment then, um, what Fellman will argue is that he is not simply responding to the judge, but responding in his own mind now to the Nazi. The judge has turned into a Nazi. So the courtroom has become a scene from the past, or rather the Holocaust has entered the present of the courtroom. And the way what has happened is that Kitsetnik has become like the dead. The judge in the reenactment has become, has taken the place of the Nazi. And then the audience has taken the place of um, Kitsetnik um, looking at the dead. So there's a, a shift and they're all, um, we have now a different relations among the dead, dying, the living and the Nazi that's now coming back from the past. Um, and uh, what is it then exactly that, what moment exactly uh, that is happening at that moment? And again, um, Fellman describes it. She says, Kitsetnik undergoes severe traumatic shock in re-experiencing the same terror and panic 
that dumbfounded him each time when as an inmate, he was suddenly confronted by the inexorable Nazi authorities of Auschwitz, the call to order by the judge urging the witness to obey impacts the witness physically as an invasive call to order by an SS officer. Once more, the imposition of a heartless and unbending rule of order violently robs him of his words and in reducing him to silence, once more threatens to annihilate him, to erase his essence as a human witness. So what does this mean um, exactly? She, Philman is arguing that this, at this moment, uh, Ketsetnik re-experiences a particular moment of selection when the Nazi says, you die, you live. Um, she doesn't say it's the moment of selection, but everything in her essay points toward that. So what is happening at this moment of selection that eliminates uh, Ketsetnik is a human witness. And what I argue here is that it is a particular kind of annihilation of the addressee. So his collapse in the courtroom in which he interrupts and uh, the address reenacts an annihilation of address at this moment. And how can we understand that? And the call, what Hillman calls the call to order that that he experiences physically um, and that eliminates him as a human witness. Um, the way I interpret it here is that the call to order is the command, you go to the left, you go to the right, you die, you live. Um, and that command, uh, ordinarily a command is addressed to another human being, one human to another. But in the case of this command, the target of the command is not being addressed as human, but is being addressed rather as the dehumanized subject. And in fact, the command itself is dehumanizing. Um, more precisely, that means that in presumably addressing another human, it actually eliminates that person as an addressee because the Jew is not a person. Uh, for the Nazi. So you die, you live is also saying you are not a you. You are not an addressee. You are not someone who can ever be an addressee. There's no you there. Um, and what that also means is that the dead are being eliminated as addressees. Literally, they're being murdered. The ones who are told to go to the gas chambers. But the living, the survivors, Ketsetnik, are equally dehumanized. Um, so at the moment that he would be the survivor who could witness what is going on, he is eliminated as an addressee, which means as someone also who could be an addressor. So he is no longer someone who can tell the story of his own and the other's victimization. So there are two kinds of annihilation here. One is the annihilation of those who die. The other is the annihilation of the living as addressees. And the two together constitute the Holocaust as an event that erases its own witness, that eliminates uh, those who could tell the story um, as potential um, addressors of the story. So, um, what we can also understand here is that um, this command and response that gets reenacted in the courtroom has a particular temporal structure. Um, because the act of the command, which in, is a speech act that um, the speech act theorist J.L. Austin called an illocutionary act. It's an act with a certain force. It's a command. It's not a truth statement. Um, that act has inscribed in it already the effect that it should have. So ordinarily a command, I make a command to you and you respond. So there's a cause in the command and an effect in the response. But in this case, the effect is the elimination of the person as a person, as an address. 
democracy. And that has already taken place the moment the command is made because in commanding you, I eliminate you as human, which means I eliminate you as addressee. So by the time the command is received, um, strikes the one to whom it is aimed, at whom it is aimed, it is already too late to, uh, to resist that dehumanizing element. Um, by the time I receive the command, I am already eliminated as an addressee. So that the structure of that command, of the command that eliminates um, its addressee, um, is itself something that happens too soon um, to be received, to be known, to be resisted. And that is precisely the structure of trauma. So the command that annihilates me as addressee is something I can never receive in time. And this is the too lateness, the belatedness of trauma. And that is what comes back um, in the courtroom when Kitsetnik falls. So Feldman uses the word terror um, and I'm reinterpreting that word, which seems like a psychological word, that affect is the affect of um, no longer being an addressee, and that returns physically in the fall. Um, and what that it what it returns is as is specifically, not only can he not be an addressee of the court in the courtroom, but Kinsetnik at this moment also cannot address the courtroom. So he can no longer tell his own story, um, which means he can no longer be heard. So um, it's that collapse of address, annihilation of address that then comes back in the courtroom. And it comes back later in the sense that courtroom in Jerusalem is later than the event of the Holocaust. But it also comes back as something that was inherently always belated. That is the response to this command um, that elim eliminates him as a human witness. So, um, just two notes um, that, first of all, as I say in the essay, um, it's not simply about Kitsetnik, it's the whole courtroom that's involved at this moment um, because they are all repositioned in that scene, um, again, as the, the dying, as the living, um, and as the Nazi. Um, and she says, the law loses consciousness here which means the law is also repeating something here. What does it repeat? And she does not say, but what I would suggest is that the legal system is also re-encountering its own participation in this event since the Holocaust started with the Nuremberg laws with the um, taking away of citizenship and other legal procedures that ultimately undid um, the citizenship and legal protections um, of the Jews. So uh, the law itself, it, the institution is also encountering and re-experiencing um, its own um, collapse. And Feldman says that, uh, uh, that she says that the law is blind to its own constitutive and structural relation to trauma. Um, and it's this uh, repetition that it puts on trial. Um, so again, the moment of the collapse is also the moment of the institution bring its own implication in the event. So in that sense, also the trauma here is institutional, societal and collective as well as individual. Okay, so quickly, I don't wanna to take too long because I see I'm getting close to an hour and 15 minutes, but I just wanna um, say that this is also then, um, uh, oh, I wanna say something about the body here. So the body then um, emerges at the moment of the fall. And this will be central to Feldman's essay because we don't just have a linguistic fall. He doesn't just fall silent his body falls. Um, and at the moment that the body falls, we become aware of the body. So this moment that Feldman will call the dramatic um, 
is a testimony that happens for her through the body. So how, first of all, it happens as a reenactment in which the body becomes visible as a dead body. But it's important to notice, to note that body here doesn't mean the body we see and know. Um, when he falls, his body comes back as something unrecognizable. What does that mean? It comes back as something that cannot be witnessed, that is erased. Um, and Philman had written in her book, uh, Testimony, um, in her essay, The Return of the Voice, which is on the film uh, Shoah, the film of uh, Holocaust Testimony by Claude Lanzmann. Um, in that film, one of the survivors said that they were not allowed, when they, when they had to dig up the corpses that had been buried and burn them, um, which took uh, place at this uh, camp called Helmno. Um, so the bodies had been shot and buried. They had to be dug up later and then um, burned. And they were not, uh, the uh, inmates doing this work were not allowed to call them corpses or bodies. They had to be called figurin, um, which turned them into unreal, um, non-corporeal objects. So what happens when we see the body of Ketzetnik fall is we don't just see a dead body, we see the unrecognized, the erased body. We see the erasure as well as the body that is erased um, of the Holocaust. Um, so we see annihilation, but in two forms as the body and as witness, the annihilation of witness. Um, this moment, so this moment is a reenactment in that sense through the body. Um, but um, the body is also the site of what she will, Thelman will say is this new form of testimony. So how do we understand that? And uh, the way I understand what Thelman is doing here when she talks about the body, this fall as being part of the dramatic, which is a term she takes from Benjamin, uh, who's writing about Goethe, um, is the dr dramatic in Benjamin is a gesture even in, even in a written text, it's a gesture that points what, to what is beyond words. Um, and so, um, um, uh, so Feldman says, Kotsetnik's testimony does not simply tell about the impossibility of telling, it dramatizes it, it enacts it. Um, it's a dramatic moment. Um, so it enacts or shows through the fall of the body, this impossibility. So what I believe is happening at this moment in, in Feldman's reading is that the body splits. It splits on the one hand, it splits into on the one hand, this erased corpse that reappears in the courtroom. But also on the other hand, it is um, this role, it's playing a role on a stage. It's in the courtroom, it's not in an actual camp. Um, and indeed, when it falls, we see the courtroom because we see the, him fall out of the witness box. So the staging element of the courtroom um, appears. And uh, at this moment, she says, uh, then the dramatic is making visible really what is not visible. What is not visible here is that speech act of the Nazi is that being annihilated as an addressee. And this is what Feldman says is a, um, um, she says the speaking body has become a dying body. The body's testimony creates a new dimension of the trial, a physical legal dimension that dramatically expands what we can be grasped, uh, what can be grasped as legal meaning. So uh, what does that mean? And how is that related to what I've said is this production of a new kind of address. So the collapse of the body is the reenactment of the collapse of address, but it is dramatically producing the possibility of a different address. And why, why does that, how can we understand that um, in Feldman's sense? And so we can understand it in terms of what happens to the audience in the courtroom. So not the judge and the prosecutor, but the, the audience sitting there. Because when the body falls, on the one hand, the audience becomes Ketzetnik. They're placed before a dead body the way he was placed before those going off to die in the camp. 
So they become confused with Ketsetnik just as Ketsetnik becomes his confused with the dead. So it's the confusion of death and life and that is the trauma. But also they reverse that position because when he falls, you see a lot of the audience members stand up. They're trying to see and they're trying to see something they don't get, which is what has happened to him. So two things then happen at once. The fall makes visible this response too late to the Nazi, the annihilation of the addressee. And at the same time, it leads to a new kind of seeing by a different audience that now has to stand in for Kitsetnik. Um, so the audience becomes a new kind of uh, addressee to whom is passed on the command to address others, to bear witness to others. Um, so um, that too, the dramatic fall, the one that we can see is echoed and reversed in the dramatic standing up and notice what's happening here is not only um, movement, let's say between speech and speech, which would be ordinarily what you would think of as witness, but it's a, a movement happening between body and body as well. It's a bodily, something that's passed on through the body. And again, we can interpret that literally, he falls, they stand up. We can understand that also in terms of the notion of this new kind of address as having an impact that exceeds what it says, that has a force that takes place as a gesture. Um, and uh, this, I understand to be the passing on of a particular thing that Feldman does not mention. We see it in, the, um, in his testimony. Um, oops, he says, um, Uh, if I am able to stand here in this court before you and retell the tale of this planet, if I, out of this planet of Auschwitz, am able to be here with you today, then I believe with all my being that this is thanks to the oath I made to them there. They gave me the strength. This oath was my armor, and this was the unnatural part above nature which sustained me as a Muslim to withstand Auschwitz. They always left me, they always took leave of me and the look in their eyes had the promise of my oath in them. So um, what is being passed on is a promise, but a promise that comes back from the dead, from the eyes. And the promise is the promise to tell the story. He had promised to tell their story. Um, and this promise that's coming back through the eyes of the dead is also figured by Fellman um, in her essay by her picking up on this word, the expressionless from Benjamin um, and the death's head. So it's a kind of face that is kind of addressing another, but it is different from a face to face, a speech to speech, a knowing to knowing. Um, it's the kind of figure for a different kind of communication that takes place precisely at the point of the collapse of ordinary forms of address, um, whether legal or literary. Um, and that offers a, a, a possibility of a kind of gesture um, that bears witness in a new way. Okay, so, um, that's it for me. And I um, am very happy to take questions now uh, about anything, whether it's about this essay and my reading of it or uh, more generally about um, trauma or uh, about um, the context in which you've been thinking about trauma, which also um, brings up the issues of what it means to use this word, this notion, this example in a different um, cultural, uh, if not entirely diff different linguistic context. So um, should I, uh, Nitin, do you want me to look at the questions in the chat and answer them or do you want to pick them? Uh, hello, ma'am. Uh, my name is Dan and uh, me and oh, Lai- Oh, Dan, okay, sorry. 
Hello, ma'am. Thank you for that truly enlightening talk. Uh, me and Nainu will be reading the questions that have been posted in the chat box. We've got a lot of questions. So uh, okay. if you have any trouble hearing us due to our lack of connectivity, please ask us to repeat and we shall gladly do so. So okay. shall, we, shall we start? Yes. Okay. The first question is from Angelina Elizabeth. She's asked, uh -huh. what is your take on the theoretical shift from a Western-centered event-based model of trauma to a pluralistic conceptualization, which includes the mundane, systemic, and invisible forms of trauma, which is experienced by disadvantaged groups like minorities, women, and children in the post-colonial world. Yeah, that's great. So uh, one reason, so if, if I take it back to this essay, um, a lot of the work, uh, so Freud's notion of trauma, a lot of my own work, um, even the work of Feldman and Laub, as we see in this essay, um, has often been interpreted as being event-based, i.e. a single event. So in this case, that event seems to be, let's say, the Holocaust. Um, but already in Freud, uh, the idea of repetition, the fact that a trauma is never a single event, um, that it is, that it is its repetition, um, already opens up the idea of trauma from being only focused on one catastrophe to being the accumulation of repeated experience. And he even talks about this in uh, Moses and Monotheism, he talks about cumulative trauma. And so from, as I understand it, even within what looks like events-based trauma, we already have an opening to what you just called um, mundane trauma or everyday trauma. Um, I think um, Gyan Pandi refers to, um, in, the, in the Indian context specifically, to routine violence when he's talking about uh, Gyananda Pandi, who's at Emory University where I used to teach. And, um, so, and in, in um, the first book I edited on trauma, Laura Brown um, wrote an essay about the experience of um, women and uh, gay people who, uh, because at that time, the, the definition of trauma and the, the psychiatric definition and the Diagnostic and Statistic um, Manual of Mental Disorders, uh, define trauma as an event outside the range of usual human experience. That has now been changed. Um, but at that time, when it was psychiatrically uh, defined as an event, uh, she pointed out that for people experiencing everyday uh, oppression, discrimination, silencing, etc., cetera, that, uh, that trauma is not just a single event. And so I think that, um, this, first of all, the idea of repetition opens trauma from being event-based. It's, it, it's never in any case a single event, um, but it, uh, it, it can be experienced through um, ongoing um, uh, dehumanization, for example, um, or elimination of uh, a person as an addressee. So I'll give another example from those early years. Um, uh, Tom Keenan, a colleague and I, an ex-colleague, interviewed um, AIDS activists, HIV positive AIDS activists. And the experience of trauma for these AIDS activists, in particular, Greg Bordowitz, who was one of them, was that they, and it was interesting because it was already about address. He said, when they were brought on TV, they were put in shadow and behind potted plants and the like. Um, because they were not allowed to, to appear as HIV positive people addressing other HIV positive people. The address was presumably at, at straight non-HIV positive people. So there you have an example of, and this is why I also think the rethinking of trauma through the notion of address is important. There you have a, a, con a conceptualization of traumatic experience as being um, an ongoing experience, not necessarily this event or that event, it can be ongoing violence that is um, not 
tellable to others, is not heard or seen by others. So in that sense, I would argue that um, if we, one thing that's helpful, I think about reconceptualizing, tra reconceptualizing trauma through the problem of address is that it has this potential um, to be understood as a, um, both within a collective context and it doesn't need to be linked to this event or that event. It can be the experience of being not considered someone who can be heard or whose story is not received. Um, and so the not knowing element of trauma is no longer associated with an event that happened too soon to be grasped. Um, the, the not knowing is actually that social, cultural um, non-receipt of the story or um, undermining the authority of the one who tells. So the work on madness um, by Devon and Godier is about also the mad um, for them are bearing witness to trauma, trying to bear witness to trauma in their madness. But of course, madness is not considered to have any authority as speech. Um, and um, so uh, the, the victim, the, tra the, the trauma here is both uh, experienced by, let's say either individuals or groups as a whole who are not considered authoritative um, witnesses of their own experience. Um, and it is also uh, a social, uh, socio-political um, uh, phenomenon. And I would just note that in Feldman's essay, again, it seems to be very event-oriented. We can point to this moment in the camp and we talked about the Holocaust, but her argument there, as I read it, is also that the institution is also reenacting something. And that institution is not necessarily simply about one event. That institution is about a legal, it has to do with the way that the legal language and the legal institution can uh, itself eliminate uh, subjects as addressees. And my final comment on that will be, would be if we wanna turn to um, uh, uh, other marginalized peoples, we can think of the poem uh, Zong by M. Norbisi Philip, um, which is um, an attempt to a poem that is based on, but the um, tearing apart of the language of a um, legal judgment having to do with slaves who were thrown overboard um, when they were being transported um, from Africa to, to another country and they were, they were thrown overboard. And then the, uh, um, the owners of the ship tried to get insurance reimbursement for them. And the legal uh, decision um, is itself, although it's not uh, on the side of the slave owners, the legal decision never considers the inhumanity of the act. So it's a legal question about whether or not the owners deserve to get insurance. So there you have a language that dehumanizes and this poem tries to, as she says, resurface the bodies um, uh, and the voices um, by undoing that language. So. Um, so in other words, I, I, I do think that we have to reconceptualize trauma in a way or bring out what in the conception of trauma was never really only about single events or about individuals. Um, and that's partly what I'm trying to do with this notion of the collapse of address. Does that, is that answer the question? And if the person wants to respond uh, and ask me more, I'm glad to go back and forth on that. Ma'am, we have a lot of questions, so shall we move on to the next one? Okay. So, uh, ma'am, the next question is from Alfie Sebastian. What do you think of Shark Lakan's interpretation of the real stage as a traumatic experience and the significance of going being the symbolic as a necessary characteristic of the real stage. Mm. 
So uh, what, I'm sorry, was that uh, Lacan's the mirror, the mirror stage? Was that a question about the mirror stage? Not exactly, Sean. Sure, okay. yeah, just... Interpretation of the real stage. Uh, of, oh, of, of the real. Yes, ma'am. Okay, uh, sorry. Um, so, um, as I understand, so I'm not a Lacan um, scholar, expert. I've written one essay on Lacan, so I'm going to have to work with that. Um, and uh, as I understand um, the real, um, as so I'll take the example that I wrote about, um, and that is Lacan's um, interpretation of Freud's story about the dream of the burning child, and that is when a father, he says, um, he's told by a patient about a father who was uh, watching over his child um, and the child was dead. The child had died from a fever and the father was watching over and there were candles around the child and there was an old man in the room and the father goes into another room to sleep for a few minutes and he has a dream and that it's very moving. The child comes to him in the dream and says, father, don't you see I'm burning? And the father wakes up and he sees that a candle has fallen on the bed and the corpse uh, and the uh, material over the corpse is, is burning. Um, and Lacan reads that um, as a traumatic nightmare, an awakening. And he reads it as trauma because the father is not awoken by the candle falling, by the sound or the light. He's woken by the words of the child. Father, don't you see I'm burning? And he calls that encounter the real. Um, that is the real interrupting the symbolic, which would presumably be what would be the realm in which the father identifies as father, as conscious father, um, the son as son in this relationship with father and um, a world in which there would be a communication, let's say between father and son, where the, the son says to the father, don't you see I'm burning? And the father would then respond. And in, the, in waking up, the father repeats something, which is his inability to have not only saved his child, but even witnessed his child adequately in his dying. And what's interesting to me there is about this understood as the real, as a kind of recurrent interruption of the father as consciousness is in, in the symbolic realm, he is uh, reduced to unconsciousness and to helplessness in relation to the child. But it's also interesting to me to go back to that now because it's also a failed address. Um, the child asked the father to wake up and why did, why, what does this repeat? Well, he, when he wakes up, he no longer can respond to the child in the dream. Um, the child says, wake up, and he wakes up out of the dream. Uh, so the child says, see me, don't you see I'm burning? And the father wakes up, so he doesn't see the child. So he repeats his inability to witness. Um, so there's a kind of failed address there. He responds too late to the, to the child. Um, but at the same time, uh, the child's don't you see I'm burning is also saying, saying wake up see that I'm burning, i.e. the corpse is burning. So the, the father does respond to um, the child, but always too late and always in a mode that can no longer save him, um, but has to kind of take the form of, of a testimony um, to the failure to have witnessed him. So the real there is also a moment when the um, collapse of witness takes place. And I suppose going to your question, one could think of that collapse of witness perhaps as a failure within the symbolic realm, within speech, um, a failure of that communication, of the communication of speech as an address, an address within a realm in which there is also a particular um, positioning of father, son, and um, mother, and so on. Um, and so um, I think there that the real is also 
uh, in Lacan also understood in part as bursting through, you know, sort of erupting at that moment of failure, um, failed witness, um, but also as, again, a um, potential for rethinking what address, what communication would be about. So what, um, what testimony to the real would look like. So unlike, I think there are people like Zizek, the real as sort of completely outside of language, sort of inaccessible to language. Um, but in fact, in this case, at least, the real is um, emerging as a, um, a little bit like the dramatic in the Feldman essay, as a site at which um, communication or address or witness or language are being um, altered in order to transmit uh, something that has no simple um, capacity to be communicated in ordinary um, linguistic terms uh, within, let's say, the symbolic. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, the next question is from Dr. Vimal Mohan John. It's a lengthy question. Okay. How reliable are Freudian frameworks in their postulations regarding the content of dreams and the meanings of latent dream images? For instance, how do these frameworks explain traumatic dreams and nightmares or dreams with overt sexual content rather than latent or sublimated sexual context? Does psychoanalysis explain traumatic dreams as masochistic fantasies? Or are there some fundamental contradictions within it wherein some dreams have an overwhelming immediacy to them, while some are more about the subtext? Uh, can you can you reread that last line? Yes. Thus, uh, oh, last line. Yeah, it's one line. Does yeah. psychoanalysis explain the traumatic dreams as masochistic fantasies? Are there some fundamental contradictions within it, Erin? Some dreams have an overwhelming immediacy to them, and some are more about the subtext. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, the, so the nightmare is, um, as you say, you know, it's the central um, site for Freud of um, the central traumatic symptom. And actually, so... Uh, Actually, when he first talks about the traumatic nightmare in Beyond the Pleasure Principle, the traumatic nightmare there is not a masochistic fantasy. It is, uh, it is true that he, what he refers to specifically is in chapter two, Beyond the Pleasure Principle. And he talks, he's worried about the way in which certain phenomena, specifically traumatic phenomena, do not um, accord with his theory of um, his previous psychoanalytic theory, including the theory of dreams. Um, all of that theory, he says, is governed by the pleasure principle. So we can interpret any psychic phenomenon as being an attempt to reduce unpleasure, to reduce stimulation. Um, and so, for example, when we have a dream, um, the dream allows for uh, a repressed fantasy to emerge, uh, particularly an Oedipal fantasy from childhood. Um, so the desire for, let's say, the desire for the parent of the opposite sex, which is a prohibition, it's been repressed. And it would, under ordinary circumstances, to have an, an ordinary, you know, waking thought about it would be very unpleasurable because it's a prohibition. It's it's prohibited desire. So when it comes back unconsciously in the dream, it's a, it it can come back in a hidden fashion, so that it is um, not unpleasurable. So it is a compromise of sorts, and and so that would be the ordinary function of dreams, which would be to allow for, let's say, uh, unconscious desire to return, but in a way that was not um, unpleasurable because it, it's not conscious. The prohibition is overcome there because it, the dream is unconscious and it's, it's also hidden by, it comes back symbolically. Um, 
a secondary function of sleep among, according to the pleasure principle is of dreams is that they help you sleep. The consciousness wants to sleep, Freud says. So what happens in Beyond the Pleasure Principle is that the soldiers coming back from World War I remind him of other uh, survivors of accidents, uh, train accidents, for example, where their life has been threatened. And in those um, uh, dreams, uh, they do not obey the pleasure principle. First of all, they wake you out of sleep. So the dream is not functioning to keep you asleep. Secondly, and this goes to your point about immediacy. Secondly, he says, they bring the patient back into the situation which caused him to fall ill. Um, a situation from which he wakes up in another fright. So uh, for Freud, the traumatic dream challenges the pleasure principle. Um, not so much as a uh, sadistic, let's say, fantasy or as a um, fulfilling, let's say, in that case, sort of mas masochistic desire or masochistic fantasy. Rather, it's unpleasurable because it, um, it cannot be interpreted via the pleasure principle, i.e. A, uh, as reducing stimulation B as symbolic, um, C as having to do with anything having to do with internal wish or fantasy. Um, it's rather uh, an event that is external, a life-threatening event that comes inside directly, but in sleep. So it's not something that uh, could be consciously recognized or faced. Um, but when it comes in the dream, it comes as if it were completely literal, completely itself, as if it were a memory, but it's not a memory. So the surprise of the nightmare is that wakes you up in the case of trauma is that it is precisely the immediate experience coming in the dream, which is not immediate. And he what he says is these nightmares, these nightmares are not representations. They're not symbolic. What they are, he says, is repetitions. He says it brings the patient back to the situation of his accident, a situation from which he wakes up in another fright. So both the nightmare and the awakening from the nightmare are repetitions. And they are repeating an event, the experience of an an external event or an, an encounter with death outside of the self. Um, and so uh, they, in a sense, and, and part of the paradox of them is they bring on the inside of the psyche, something that should be on the outside of the psyche without any mediation, without the mediation of fantasy, without the mediation of sim symbolic representation. Um, so, they turn the person into, as other traumatic symptoms do, into a kind of vehicle, the dream, instead of being the place where fantasy can be turned into symbolism that fulfills an unconscious wish. In this case, the dream serves the function of bringing back a death encounter um, that uh, was not grasped as it, as it occurred, number one. And number two, they wake you up. So they wake you um, out of the comfort of sleep. And, and so in that sense, I would say they, yes, they're not according to the pleasure principle, but they're not really, they're not, um, they're not masochistic fantasies. They're not fantasies at all. And what this means more generally for Freud, I think is, that they can't be interpreted really. So I, I've often been misunderstood because when I've talked about that dream, I've talked about um, the dream as being literal, that the images are literal, they're not symbols. But they're not literal in the way we would talk about a representation as being literal or a memory as having a kind of literal, uh, ob you know, a literal representation of an object because they're not representations exactly, they, they are repetitions. And um, uh, 
So they are, we could say part of the event. Um, and thus they are as uninterpretable as the event was originally. And so they are, when Freud goes to chapter four of Beyond the Pleasure Principle, he wants to understand these nightmares. And he says that, that in chapter four, he says that trauma is um, an event that breaks through the stimulus barrier of the psyche. Stimulus barrier is a temporal barrier, among other things. So they are events that happen too soon to be grasped. And the consciousness tries to go back to one more moment before the event and to pre prepare retroactively for the thing for which it had not been prepared in the first place. That of course fails because you can't relive something 